Hey guys, it's Sarah. Thank you so much for watching. So today I am doing a Q&A video. I am going to have to split this up into two parts, I think I'm realizing, because you guys had a ton of questions. I asked you guys on my YouTube community tab and also on my Instagram stories last week what questions you'd like me to answer, and there are so many questions. So I've kind of categorized them, grouped them together, combined some that were really similar, but I think in this first video we're just going to cover the questions that are related to makeup, to cruelty-free topics, um, vegetarian slash veganism related questions, and YouTube related questions. So that's going to be part one, and then in part two we're going to cover my more personal type questions. So a lot of you had questions about my job, about uh, you know places I've traveled, uh, music that I listen to, things like that, like hobbies, um, other kind of personal life questions. So that's going to be part two. So before we waste any more time, I'm going to go ahead and start getting into some of these questions. Let's start with the makeup related questions. First question, when did you start getting into makeup? I, I started getting into makeup right around my senior year of high school. So about seven, seven years ago um, was when I really started getting into it. And I was watching, I started watching YouTube videos kind of randomly. I think I had bought some e.l.f. products and I really do kind of credit e.l.f., <laughs> the brand e.l.f. for getting me into makeup because they were so affordable. They still are, but they were, everything back then was either one dollar or three dollars and so I was so excited to try some of their products and I think I was kind of looking up like how to use their like gel eyeliner and that was when I discovered Emily Noel's channel and then it kind of just snowballed from there. So that's when I got into makeup. Next makeup question, why don't you try more Project Pans? Um, I, so I have one project pan going on pretty much at all times, and I feel like that's a good amount for me. I have been doing just a rolling project 10 pan that goes throughout the whole year. Last year I also did a uh, finish 13 by Halloween like seasonal project pan on top of my year-long project, and it did actually, that actually worked out really well, so maybe if a seasonal project came up that made sense to do in addition to my year-long project, I would, but for now I feel like just one rolling project pan. That's all that's really necessary for me right now. If you could have any beauty superpower, what would it be? Uh, like, could do a perfect cat eye every time, or always find the perfect shade of red lipstick, etc. Um, I would probably go with being able to do my brows perfectly every time. I feel like brows are the thing that I struggle with the most. I never seem to get my brows to look quite the way I want them to, um, and it would just be really nice to just know that my brows are going to turn out perfectly every time. Um, if I ever were to get like a cosmetic procedure done, it would be microblading my brows because I don't really enjoy doing my brows. It's just kind of one of those, th one of those things that I have to do. Well, I don't have to do it, but you know, it's, it's kind of, I feel that it's a necessary part of my like makeup routine and I, it just, it takes a long time. They never turn out the way I want them to. So that would be, that would be the superpower that I would pick. One of you asked, is there a look that you haven't tried yet but think looks great? So one type of look that I haven't tried yet and that I just recently started hearing about is negative space. Like, I think that there's a lot of different ways you can use that technique, but I think it's mostly used in like eyeshadow looks. Um, like you can do a negative space cut crease or eyeliner. I've even seen like negative space brows. The first time I heard the term negative space, I was like, what? It sounded like something from like a science fiction movie or something. Like I, it just sounded kind of, almost kind of creepy, but um, that's something I want to try. <laughs> I'm kind of scared to though, but it looks really cool on a lot of people. I don't know if I could pull it off because I have barely even mastered like a normal cut crease at this point, but that is one uh, look that I would like to eventually be able to do. Another great question, have you always been into having a curated makeup collection or was there a point in your life where you just couldn't stop buying makeup? I've always been pretty into just having a curated collection. Having too many products has always kind of stressed me out a little bit and I think that's just kind of my personality. It, it just overwhelms me so I've always kind of preferred to have a smaller collection. Now that's not to say I'm not tempted to buy makeup and project panning and things like that definitely help me keep it under control, especially having a YouTube channel. It can be very tempting and very easy to go overboard with buying products, but I've always been pretty into having a curated makeup collection and I've never had a giant collection. I definitely just enjoy having fewer things and that goes for every area of my life, not just makeup. Kind of along those same lines, how do you stop from how do you stop yourself 
from buying more eyeshadows and lipsticks. So the best way I've found to stop myself from buying too many eyeshadows and lipsticks in particular is by really switching things up in those categories a lot. So that's why I have my four weeks for lipsticks and my eyeshadow roulette um, kind of series going on on my channel right now. That's just a really fun way for me to kind of keep things fresh and keep from getting bored. With both of those I use random.org to select um, you know, five pans of eyeshadow or four, lips four lipsticks for my collection to focus on for the next month or however long. And I, it just, it makes products that are not new to me feel new again. It kind of just keeps my collection more fun and interesting. Um, and I definitely recommend doing that if you're trying to curb your spending. Um, either that or project panning. I, I personally don't normally like to pan eyeshadows and lipsticks. Those are things that I, since I have kind of a, a larger collection in those categories, I prefer to do like the, you know, shop my stash type stuff with those. And really just any kind of shopping your stash you can do. Um, really helps. It, it helps me to just kind of keep things fresh. What are your favorite skincare products? So my favorite skincare brand is Paula's Choice, but I am not, I'm trying not to buy from them so much anymore because they're just a little bit too pricey. So I'm still kind of in the early stages of figuring out a good like drugstore skincare routine. But my favorite products from Paula's Choice are their BHA exfoliants. I really like the one from their Resist line. I think it's their Resist daily pore refining treatment, and also the one that's in their clear line. Um, both of those are really good. I definitely notice a big difference in my skin when I use those. I like their niacinamide booster, um, their sunscreens I really liked. So I, I do miss Paula's Choice, but um, I'm, I'm kind of, I've got like a budget-friendly, cruelty-free skincare video in the works. It's probably going to be a few months because I'm still in the very early stages of you know, testing out products and figuring out if they work for me and stuff, but a couple of my favorite drugstore skincare products are some cleansers. I really like the Alba Botanica Even Advanced Cleansing Gel. That's a really good, just basic, gentle cleanser. I'm also liking the cleanser from Everyman Jack. It's like their charcoal acne cleanser. Both of those are really good. I have a pretty easy time finding drugstore cleansers that I like. It's more the other things. Um, I'm liking the Pixie Glow Tonic, but I do wish it didn't have fragrance in it. That's like the one gripe I have with that product, because it is a really good product. Um, and it's it's good enough as a replacement for me, but I still like the Paula's Choice ones better. Yeah, that's about all I can think of right now as far as drugstore skincare, but um, hopefully I'll have more favorites soon. Um, okay, last makeup question, and there were also some questions about cruelty-free beauty, and we'll get to that in, right after this. Um, so, you get to use only one makeup brand for the rest of your life. What do you pick? I think I would choose e.l.f. The reason for that is because they are a drugstore brand, and that was one... If I could only use one brand for the rest of my life, I'd want it to be a pretty budget-friendly option, because I don't want to have to buy expensive makeup all the time. So, the other reason I chose e.l.f. is because they have a really wide variety of of products. They have a lot of different lines, like they have their active line, they have their like beautifully bare collection, they have, um, they seem to have like several options in each product category. So they have a few different foundations, they have a few different concealer formulas, they have a really good eyeshadow palette that I love, they have, you know, they pretty much make good product, at least like good or average products in every category. So that's why I would choose e.l.f. <laughs> um, but e.l.f. is not my favorite brand. So getting into the next category of questions, um, you guys had a few questions about being cruelty-free. So first one of you asked, what is your favorite cruelty-free brand? So I would actually say that my favorite brand that's cruelty-free is Wet n Wild. So it's interesting. I wouldn't choose Wet n Wild to use for the rest of my life because they, they don't have a foundation that I like, that I know of. I haven't tried their stick foundation, but I don't think I would like it. They don't have, I don't think they have a brow product that I really like. I feel like, I don't know, I feel like I just have a better shot at like finding something in every category from e.l.f. than I do from Wet n Wild, but Wet n Wild is my favorite brand because they just, they first of all they do a really good job keeping their prices consistent. I feel like e.l.f. has been really creeping up there. They used to be like the cheapest brand at the drugstore and now they're just as expensive as like Milani and you know other brands like that sort of like mid-range drugstore brands, but Wet n Wild seems to stay in that like $5 price range for the most part. They have some more expensive products now, but they seem to, to stay pretty consistently affordable. 
And the other thing I love about Wet n Wild is they do a really good job kind of staying on top of the trends. I just think they're such a fun brand. Uh, I get a little bit more excited about Wet n Wild than I do about e.l.f. for some reason. Probably because of the price point, but I would say that Wet n Wild is my favorite cruelty-free brand. What products were a struggle to find cruelty-free dupes for? So I... I went cruelty free right around the time that I was really getting into makeup so I, I wish I had a better answer for this but I really didn't have any like holy grail products at the time that I was going cruelty free. Most of the brands that I used were like CoverGirl, Maybelline, a little bit of Revlon but I didn't have any products from those brands that I really loved because I just wasn't that into makeup yet and I didn't really even know what I liked in makeup. I just kind of used them for like very practical reasons and I didn't really know. I don't know. I hadn't tried that many products at the time, so it just wasn't it wasn't really a struggle for me to find dupes. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for that, but I just don't. What was the hardest part about going cruelty-free, and did you do it all at once or slowly? So I think I kind of did it pretty quickly, but mostly because I at the time, like I said, I didn't have a lot I didn't have a large makeup collection. Pretty sure all the makeup I had fit in like a little makeup bag. Um, like a very small pouch <laughs> and that was that was pretty much all I had so I didn't have a lot of products that I needed to use up and replace but I did do it kind of gradually I kept some of those products around but I also bought some new cruelty free products at the same time and I sort of slowly decluttered the the cruel the non cruelty free products that I had um, I don't think I used most of them up all the way so yeah I would say I did it pretty slowly um, and what was the hardest part about going cruelty free? I would say just all of the misinformation that's out there. It's very easy to just Google like is such and such brand cruelty free and just click on whichever blog post comes up first. And the problem with that is a lot of blogs are just, they're just outdated. A lot of cruelty free lists haven't been updated in like two years. And the other thing is that a lot of, you know, a lot of people who have those types of blogs on the internet like maybe don't have the same criteria for whether a brand is cruelty free as I do. And so I think that it was just hard to know what sources to trust and which ones not to trust uh, when I was first getting into it. So that was the hardest part. I think that's pretty much the hardest part for everyone. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, it's just hard to figure out what's true and what isn't. Um, that's why it's really important to, to do your research into different cruelty-free certifications. I, I pretty much strictly follow Logical Harmony because I feel like my criteria for cruelty-free pretty much matches up with hers completely, so I just trust her because she does an amazing job keeping it up to date, and so that's that's what I choose to use. Um, and then the, the last question in this category was, why did you decide to go vegan slash cruelty-free? So I this is a good kind of segue into the next section, which is going to be about vegetarian slash veganism. I had a few questions about that. So um, why did I decide to go cruelty free? I decided to go cruelty free because I just care about animals <laughs> and I always have. Animal protection, animal animal rights and all of that has always been really like important to me ever since I was a kid. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to support it anymore. It was just kind of a matter of learning how to not support animal testing. Um, and so, yeah, it just it kind of just seemed like a no-brainer to me. And then for the vegan part of that question, let's go ahead and dive into this next section. So one of you asked, are you vegetarian slash vegan? I do eat vegan completely. Um, I have been that way for about four and a half years now. And I also, I decided to go vegan for the same reason that I decided to go cruelty-free with my makeup because I, I just care about animals and I knew, I, I was vegetarian for a long time. Um, I was actually raised vegetarian for the most part. So I've been eating vegetarian for pretty much my whole life and then I started learning more about the dairy and egg industries and I learned that they're just as terribly cruel as the meat industry is. So I just didn't want to support it anymore and so that's why I went vegan. <laughs> Pretty simple reason but I mean I just wanted my I wanted my actions to align with my values in that way and it just I felt like if I couldn't stand to see footage of animals being used for for dairy and for eggs and for meat like it didn't make sense to support that industry anymore. Now I do want to clarify I I actually am okay with buying beauty products that contain certain animal ingredients like beeswax and carmine. 
Those are insect ingredients. Beeswax obviously comes from bees. Carmine comes from beetles. I know that a lot of people don't, a lot of people who are vegan don't purchase uh, and use the products that contain those ingredients. Uh, for me, I just think if you're vegan, you have to draw the line somewhere. You can never be 100% fully ethical in every single area of your life. And insect ingredients just don't feel that important to me compared to like the way that animals are raised for food and the same way that I feel about animal testing. I just don't feel as strongly about beeswax and carmine. <laughs> Those are the main two ingredients that tend to show up in beauty products that are not technically vegan. Um, and you know, that probably makes a lot of people angry, but I mean, that's just, I don't feel like I need to justify that any further. I do have a lot more thoughts on it and maybe I could do a whole nother video on that, but I don't want to spend too much time on it today because no one specifically asked that in here and it's, it's it would be a long conversation, so I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, so most people, some people would probably say that I'm just plant-based because I because I am okay with like certain like trace amounts of insect ingredients in products. That's fine. I mean, I'm not, I, I, sure, I guess I am just plant-based, but I mean, I don't, I don't wear leather, I don't wear wool, I don't purchase products that are tested on animals. I do try to live a, a vegan lifestyle to the extent that I feel is practical for me. So if you're vegan, so kind of answered that already, did you find it hard to transition to, into such a lifestyle? So yeah, I mean, it was hard. Uh, I, so like I said, I was vegetarian. Um, my parents were pescatarian pretty much the whole time growing up, so that's how I was raised to eat. I stopped eating like fish and seafood around the time that I was 12, um, mostly because I just didn't like those foods, but also because I, I was starting to learn more about um, animal rights and stuff, and I didn't, I just didn't want to eat those foods anymore. And then when I was about 18 or 19 was when I started learning more about the dairy in industry and the egg industry. I knew that those industries were problematic, I just hadn't really taken the time to learn about them uh, until that time, and I just <laughs> figured out that like if I, if I wasn't okay with eating meat because I didn't want to hurt animals, then that was when I decided to go vegan because um, I just learned that that the way that chickens and cows are treated for dairy and eggs, it's, it's just, it's just horrible. It's, it's no better than the way that they're raised for meat. And even labels like organic, free range, cage free, all of that, like it doesn't make it any less horrific. It's just not something I want to support. So I did find it kind of hard to go from vegetarian to vegan. It took me about three months from the time I decided I was going vegan to the time that I actually did. And at the time I was a college student and I was on meal plan at my school. So I pretty much ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the dining halls. And luckily my school had pretty good vegan options, not like amazing, but they were edible. And so I was able to kind of just slowly, I started out just kind of trying to eat vegan as much as I could. And then I think there was a week, I think it was the first week of September, 2014. <laughs> I remember it vividly. Um, I. <laughs> I realized like that Friday at the end of that week that I had eaten vegan every single meal and so I was like okay I guess I'm vegan now <laughs> so it just kind of happened but I was I was patient with myself I didn't try to push myself to do it overnight because I just knew that I was more likely to stick with it if I let it be kind of a gradual change but I'm a huge advocate for just doing what you can if you feel like you can't go vegan but you do care about the cause you know, I mean, you if you just want to be like vegan one day a week or, you know, vegan for dinner, um, making gradual changes or even just making one small change and just sticking with that long term, that's better than what most people do. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of a lot of very vocal vegans out there who make make it seem like you have to go vegan or you're not doing enough and you have to be a perfect vegan or you're not doing enough. And I just I I strongly disagree. I think that anyone can can do something to help. What is one of your favorite vegan lunches or any meal? Um, I would say, I'll go ahead and say my favorite vegan lunch, at least to make it home. I'm a big fan of just like simple, easy meals, and I do cook most of my meals at home. Um, I would say I really like just like a simple like chickpea salad sandwich for lunch. Um, it's kind of comparable to just like a chicken salad or tuna salad type sandwich. I just make that. I have a recipe that I can link down below. It's not my recipe, someone else's. Um, and it's really easy to make. It's just like chickpeas, vegan mayo, or tahini, I think. I usually just use vegan mayo. 
uh, celery, carrots, just like different things that you would put in like a chicken salad. Um, and you can obviously change up the recipe however you want, but um, that's just like a really easy lunch. And I like to put that on a sandwich with like some greens and it's just like healthy, it's filling, it's easy to make. I can like prep it at the beginning of the week and have that for lunches throughout the week if I want it. Um, it's also just nice to kind of snack on. That's probably my favorite vegan lunch. What's your favorite vegan comfort food? Mac and cheese. <laughs> Mac and cheese was always my favorite comfort food even before being vegan. And I really, I do like a homemade mac and cheese. I finally found a really good mac and cheese recipe that I can also link below, but it's kind of time consuming. It's like you put it in the oven, it's got like, it has a lot of steps to it. So um, I do like that if I have the time, but if I'm also just low on time, but I want some like old school, like mac and cheese that's similar to like Kraft mac and cheese. I really like the, the vegan mac from the brand Annie's. They make a lot of non-vegan mac and cheeses too, but they do have a couple of vegan ones. The only one that's good is the vegan mac. They have another one that tastes like crap. The vegan mac is really good if you add uh, nutritional yeast to it. It tastes a little weird without it, but nutritional yeast is just it's like something that you can sprinkle onto pretty much anything and it tastes kind of cheesy. So Annie's vegan mac with nutritional yeast on top is one of my favorite like quick easy vegan comfort foods to just like whip up when I want something really comforting like that. If you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? <sighs> so are we talking like a, 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 a general type of food that I could eat for the rest of my life? Because I think I would actually say pizza because I mean you can make like a, a standard Italian pizza with like tomato sauce and cheese, vegan cheese, and whatever veggies you want on top. But then you could also do like an Ethiopian pizza. I've seen recipes for that that I really want to try. You could make like an Indian pizza. You can make, <laughs> this past weekend, I made a uh, vegan buffalo chickpea pizza. So good, it had like a white sauce. I mean, there's just, there's, there's endless possibilities with pizza. If you want to be a little bit healthier about it, you can use a whole wheat crust. Um, you can get creative with the crust. I know some people use cauliflower crust. That just sounds gross to me, but so yeah, I think I'd say pizza just because there's a lot of, you could kind of switch it up a lot, but if you're talking like one specific food, I, oh man, I would get so tired of eating the same food every day <laughs> because it's just, oh man, maybe mac and cheese again, <laughs> but I, even with that, I think I would get tired of it after like three days and I would not feel very well <laughs> after eating that and like no vegetables. Um, but yeah, hopefully pizza. I, I, I would like to go with pizza if that's allowed. Okay, so the last category of questions that we're going to cover in this video is going to be YouTube questions, and then we'll cover the rest of the questions in part two. <laughs> there are so many questions to get through. Um, you guys had a lot of really good questions. So YouTube questions, uh, one of you asked, what are your future YouTube goals? And another one asked, do you see yourself doing YouTube full-time one day, or is it just a hobby? So I don't think I've ever really talked about this much, but I would I would really, really love to be able to do YouTube full-time one day. <laughs> I would I would love to. Um, YouTube is just, it's just my favorite thing. <laughs> Besides like my family, my friends, like the people that I care about in my life, YouTube is my favorite thing to do. It gives me so much energy. I feel like, uh, I just, I don't feel like I would ever get tired of it. I know a lot of people say like, oh, if you if you ever do YouTube full time for a full time job, you'll just get burnt out. You won't enjoy it the same way that you used to. I don't see that happening, honestly. I really, I think that I would be so thrilled to be able to do this and make a living, especially as I get older and potentially have a family. I feel like this would be a great, it would be a great way to like be able to stay at home um, continue to pursue something that I love, <laughs> love doing, and still have time for, like, you know, a, a family, potentially. I don't know if I want kids, but I could see that being a really nice arrangement. Um, but even if it doesn't ever turn into a full-time job, I'm never going to stop doing it. Um, I'm happy with it just being a hobby as well because, I mean, I just love having something like this in my life that just makes me so excited. Um, I love having a creative outlet. I feel like this is like the perfect creative outlet for me. And so, yeah, but I would say I, my goal is, my future goals would be, yeah, to keep working hard and, and growing my channel as much as I can and just keep, you know, trying to create interesting 
content and connecting with people like that's that's really the overarching goal but I would love to be able to turn it into a job sometime but that's not that's not why I'm doing it like I would do this for free for the rest of my life um, yeah why did you decide to start a YouTube channel and what keeps you motivated to keep it up I decided to start a YouTube channel so I started out with a blog and my blog doesn't exist anymore because I just YouTube ended up being more fun for me but I started out as a blog and that was kind of like the gateway for me because I wanted some kind of outlet to talk about makeup and to talk about being cruelty free and so a blog was how I kind of started out doing that but I, I think I always knew that what I really wanted to do was start a channel and so I was at, by the time I'd been blogging for like maybe a year I was just itching to start a channel I just I was I was just buzzing with the urge to do it and I practiced making a few videos on like my webcam on my laptop just to kind of see <laughs> if I could do it and I I just had so much fun doing that and so eventually I did start a channel and that's why I started and then what keeps me motivated to keep it up um, and then another of you asked how do you stay motivated about life and where do you find inspiration for your videos so kind of similar question what keeps me I don't I feel like motivation isn't even really a factor for me with my channel I really just love doing it so much and it's so much fun for me that I don't really struggle to find the motivation to film or edit and that sort of thing I think it's just kind of it, I, it's it's like, I don't know, I just can't stop myself. I'm kind of obsessed, honestly. <laughs> but I think that really just the energy that it gives me is what keeps me motivated to keep doing it. It's like a vicious cycle. Like, I post a video, I, I just love the feeling of, of putting a video out there, and then that just makes me want to keep going and keep doing it. How do you stay motivated about life, and where do you find inspiration for your videos? So, about life... <laughs> um, gosh, I wish I knew the answer to that. I... I don't know, I, I like to feel like I'm getting things done, but I wouldn't say that I'm like the most motivated person, especially when it comes to things like, you know, work and, you know, doing doing things that I have to do but don't really want to do, like doing my taxes, for example, or, um, you know, going to the grocery store or meal prepping for myself for the week. Like, those are things that I, I'm not necessarily very motivated to do those kinds of things. So it, it really depends, but I do keep a planner that helps um, that helps me just keep myself organized. I just, I guess I just feel better when I'm, when I feel like I'm doing things. <laughs> um, and, and where do you find inspiration for your videos? It really depends. Um, a lot of times I find inspiration just from other YouTubers that I watch. I'll see someone post a video topic that I, you know, decide that I really want to do too. Like just recently, um, it was, I saw Ashley Clady do a video ranking all of her Urban Decay eyeshadow palettes. And that inspired me to make a video just ranking all the eyeshadow palettes I own. Sometimes it'll be, you know, a comment that I get from a subscriber uh, with a video idea. That is a huge source of inspiration for me. Sometimes ideas will just pop into my head, but I definitely think that it helps to be kind of, you know, in the community and to be an active viewer of other channels. That's kind of, I think that that's kind of what helps me kind of keep the gears turning and just kind of knowing what, what's interesting to people. What are people, what topics are people into? Um, and that definitely kind of helps to fuel the inspiration. I'm like sitting with my legs wide open right now because I was just tired of sitting cross-legged. Um, how do you structure your days so you can film videos while having a nine to five? So I do, I do work, um, I work from home and we'll touch on that more in part two of this, but I do pretty much work from nine to five each day. With my job, I have some flexibility with how I can choose to structure my days. So I don't necessarily have to work from nine to five every day. I'm allowed to, you know, if I wanted to work from eight to four or if I wanted to work from like, I mean, I can work whatever hours I want to as long as I'm getting my work done, but it is a full-time job and I do need to work about, I, you know, about eight hours, uh, five days a week, 40 hours a week. So yeah, nine to five-ish, I usually stay kind of within those hours. Lately, I've been aiming to upload four videos a week um, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five, but I try to keep it around four. I don't know if that's gonna, if it's gonna be that way forever, but uploading that number of videos every week takes about 20 hours of work for me. Between, you know, sitting down to film, editing, 
doing, you know, all the little upload tasks, like filling out the description box, creating a thumbnail, being, you know, active on Instagram, responding to comments, getting ready to film, all of that combined takes about 20 hours a week for me. It probably varies from week to week, but that's that's about how long it takes. It's a, it is a lot of work, so I... Most evenings throughout the week, I'm doing something YouTube related. Um, if I'm posting a video the next day, I'll be editing, I'll be getting that, you know, scheduled to go up in the morning. Um, some mornings I'll wake up if I need to, to film a video. I'll wake up a little bit earlier so I have time to film before I start working. Um, some days I'll film after work. Occasionally I'll film, I'll like, I might take a break from work in the middle of the day and film a video. My schedule doesn't always allow for that, but sometimes it works out that way. Um, and then weekends I also do try to film as much as I can. Sometimes on the weekend I'll sit down and film like two, three, four videos in a day and just get it kind of knocked out. Lately I haven't really been able to do that and so I've been doing uh, a lot more filming during the week. But basically a lot of mornings I wake up early to do something, whether it's upload a video or film a video or do a little bit of editing. Evenings after work I'm usually doing something YouTube related and then weekends as well. But on the weekends I, I also like to make sure that I'm getting out and hanging out with people and not just being a hermit <laughs> because since I work from home and since I do all of this from home, I really do want to make sure that I'm, you know, doing fun things and having some downtime and spending time with people on the weekends so that I don't go crazy. <laughs> so I do like to, you know, not spend my entire weekend on YouTube, which is why I do a lot of it during the week as well. But that's kind of, I don't have a specific schedule for how I structure my weeks, but that's generally how it, how it goes. How do you manage the business side of running your channel? Um, there's not a whole lot of business to it at this point. My channel is still pretty small, so there's not much in the way of like business type tasks that go on. My channel is monetized. I do make a small amount of money from Google AdSense. I, at this point, I'm not doing any sponsored videos. It's something I definitely would consider in the future if the right opportunities came up. But right now, it's just not, that's just not really something that's on my radar. The only other kind of businessy side would be dealing with brands. So I do get a handful of emails from brands every week. Most of them I am not interested in because they're not, I can't really confirm that they're cruelty free. Usually they're not listed on Logical Harmony or they're on the Logical Harmony gray area brand list. So a lot of the brands that contact me I'm just not even really interested in. But um, occasionally a brand will come along that I am interested in. It's been kind of a struggle to figure out the best way to communicate with brands because a lot of brands, <laughs> they can be a little tricky to deal with, especially when it turns out they had expectations of you that you didn't even really know about and they didn't really tell you about to begin with uh, until after they've sent you the product. So now I have, I'm kind of drafting <laughs> like a whole list of stipulations that I have if a brand offers to send me free product um, in PR, I, ha I have to outline like I, I'm not, I can't guarantee that I'll do a dedicated video on this product. I can't guarantee a positive review. Um, you know, I can only create content that's, that, that makes sense for my channel and that fits in with the videos that I already have planned. I can't just work my whole filming and posting schedule around this thing that you're sending me. There's a lot that I need to make sure that I'm communicating right off the bat and that I would say that that's probably the hardest part so far has been dealing with brands because <laughs> some brands can be really annoying. <laughs> I'm just gonna just gonna say that. And what's the easiest? Um, so I'm not sure if you meant for the business side of running a channel or just having a channel in general. I would say the easiest part of having a channel is <laughs> I almost want to say everything. It Even the hard parts don't feel that hard because it's just so fun to me. Like, it, I don't know how to describe it. Um, but honestly, dealing with subscribers has been so easy. I mean, I hear a lot of YouTubers, you know, having to like block people from their channel. A lot of these will be like larger channels. I feel like at this point my channel is so small that I don't really run into these problems very often, but I very rarely get negative comments. Occasionally I'll get comments where I have to really like think about how I'm going to respond, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But for the most part, I mean, I just feel like I have such a kind and, and like intelligent and positive group of subscribers and that is definitely one of the easiest parts of having a channel is just 
just the the connections that we make it just seems to all it just kind of magically starts to happen this person also asked what surprised you the most surrounding your social media presence as you grew so <laughs> kind of made me laugh because i i mean my social media presence is very small at this point but i think what surprises me the most is just how like such like-minded people just naturally come and watch my videos i don't know how you guys are finding me but i feel like we have so much in common i don't know how that how that works out so well but i just some of you guys will comment and like i'm just like we are on we are the same people <laughs> like we all belong together and I, it's just so cool how we all kind of gravitated towards each other and i think I, that's definitely the most weird and surprising and awesome part of having a channel so i feel like that's a good place to wrap this up that was the last youtube question so that's part one i wish that i could have fit this all into one video but it's it would just be way too long so stay tuned for part two it should be up soon i'm not sure exactly when probably in the next week or two um but i hope you enjoyed this i hope that my answers were helpful and i hope that they were what you were looking for and thank you for all of you who did leave questions i am trying really hard to make sure that I answer every single question. So um, thank you for participating. This has been really fun uh, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.